The evolution of bipedalism in early hominins is a very intriguing and hotly debated topic. Many theories accompany this on how these hominins developed walking on two legs and why. But before we dive into this topic, I would like to discuss the image presented on the screen. You probably recognize this as a stereotypical symbol of evolution. However, this image is very inaccurate to how evolution actually works. The more accurate version would be an evolution tree. The evolution of early hominins was a more branching structure. This also can be applied to most every other single animal. Certain groups of hominins would branch off from another. They will either succeed or adapt or specialize in a certain ecosystem. For example, the pranthopenes. Or this group of hominins will adapt but then perish. Evolution is a complex process and doesn't happen in order. You can see this in a modern discovery of Homo naledi. It seems to have a more primitive features than the other Homo species at the time. As you can see, evolution is in a step-to-step -step process, but a rather continuous development of selected features to fit a niche in an environment, such as bipedalism. In general, bipedalism is a posture of walking upright on two legs. This is the defining feature of us humans. It separates our species from the other great apes. The ability of bipedalism, though, requires many skeletal factors. We can use a set anatomy to determine if a species of hominin is bipedal. First and foremost is the foramen magnum. The positioning of this hole can regulate if the hominin stands upright. As humans, the foramen magnum is positioned in the center and directly downwards of the skull. This allowed the human body to stand vertically. However, for quadrupedalism and more arboreal behaviors, the foramen magnum is located on the back of the skull. This allows for knuckle-walking creatures to look straight and is in line with the spine when on all fours. This unangled femur and longer legs also displayed bipedality in a hominin. An angled femur allows for the human's feet and knees to be placed under the body center of gravity. This supported the human's balance and weight during walking. An ape's legs are more vertical femurs. This helped with walking on all fours. Longer legs, though, in humans are specialized for distance running and easier walking. Also, a more bowl-shaped pelvis acts as a support base for walking upright too. Finally, bipedality can also be identified through the feet. In apes, their thumb is diverged from the rest of the feet. This acts like another hand, proving crucial for arboreal behavior. In humans, this is not so. Our thumb is in line with the rest of the foot and acts as another leverage for walking upright. These factors can be identified by paleoanthropologists and determine whether an early hominin is bipedal or not. However, the origin of bipedalism is still unknown, but there are some very promising theories. Bipedalism in early hominins was not fully adapted. They still obtained quadrupedal features contrary to the factors listed to the latter. Some quadrupedal features can be seen in archaic hominins such as A. afarensis and the megadon archaic hominin such as Parantopus bozii. These early hominins most likely developed partial bipedal features in forested slash jungle areas. When CO2 levels dropped and C4 grasses expanded, it shrunk these forested habitats and forced these semi-bipedal hominins onto the open landscape 
of a grassland environment. This only further increased their bipedal ability. The evolution of bipedality did not affect their brain size or technological advancements, but these independent evolutionary traits converged with each other at birth. As stated before, many theories accompany the evolution of bipedalism. I will be covering the postural feeding hypothesis, the provisional hypothesis, the savanna hypothesis, and the so-called free hands hypothesis. Postural feeding hypothesis was proposed by Kevin Hunt from Indiana University. Hunt suggested that early forms of bipedalism was forged within forested slash jungle habitats. This hypothesis states that the early features of bipedalism came from the posture of standing on two feet to obtain food and keep balance, such as the picture to the right. This convenient niche of obtaining food through standing eventually led into early bipedality. This can be supported by the fact modern great apes, such as chimps and orangutans, chimps eat with their feet standing up, and orangutans use their hands to support themselves when traveling through trees, and again, such as the picture to the right. This hypothesized transition to partial bipedalism wasn't fully developed before the C4 expansion, which I will cover later in the Savannah hypothesis. Early hominins still had some arboreal behaviors because they hadn't left these forested areas. For example, Australopithecus alpharensis skeletal remains show arboreal features in their hand and shoulders. Bud has bipedal features such as their pelvis. This now leads us into the provisional hypothesis. The provisional hypothesis was suggested by Owen Lovejoy. He hypothesized that bipedality in hominins evolved from male food provisioning and monogamous relationships. It also proposes that sexual dimorphism suggested food provision and which in turn decreased infant mortality rate. This most likely extended infant care between their mothers reducing aggression and creating a more intimate relationship between the parents and the offspring. In this theory, the male hominin goes out and collects food slash resources with both hands and bipedally. As the female looks after the young and locally scavenged for resources, thus creating a monogamous relationship and developing bipedalism. This in turn reduces infighting for mates thus reducing canine size in males. I personally can see a competition for resources between hominin groups. With this, it could increase with the territorial gains for resources. Male bands would, could patrol their territory to protect these resources, possibly with tools, which would in turn lead to conflict. This is, of course, my opinion until however is just a speculation. Anyways, the provisional hypothesis correlates between the postural feeding hypothesis and the savanna hypothesis. This is the intermediary period between partial bipedality and full bipedality. The Savannah Hypothesis is probably the most accepted and known by the modern public, but it runs into some problems that I will discuss later. This theory states that because expanding C4 grasslands shrunk forested and jungle habitats, it forces early hominins from their natural environment and they are forced to adapt to an open savanna, hence the name.
Because these hominins were forced onto an open grasslands, they adapted bipedalism. Arboreal and quadrupedal behaviors would be ignorant in such an environment. Bipedalism would be better suited for this open ecosystem. It would allow the hominins to observe over the grass to find threats, better thermoregulate, and would help with predator intimidation. The use of two legs would allow the hominin to easier identify potential threats and avoid them if necessary. Bipedality would also allow for better thermal regulation. It would allow the hominin to reduce body exposure to the sun. It also allowed the creature to hit the wind currents above the grasses. This will help maintain the hominin's thermal regulation easier, thus making it more comfortable. Bipedalism would also allow for a more intimidating posture. Open grasslands don't allow for places to run and hide, to such as trees to take refuge at. This habitat is also home to large mega carnivores, such as Pachycarcuta and Homotherium. On two legs, the hominin is in a more intimidating stance and will have a better chance at scaring off the predator. If there's a group of hominins, it is even better. They get the rocks, move their hands around, and make noise. As I said before, this theory contains some major problems. Paleoclimatological evidence suggests that C4 expansion of grasslands and the fossil record of early bipedal hominins didn't happen at the proposed time the Savannah Hypothesis takes effect. Thus, the Savannah Hypothesis is not the correct theory for the origin of bipedalism. However, it will become relevant later for fully bipedal hominids. Most scholars and researchers are now considering the postural feeding hypothesis as the beginning of early hominin bipedalism. Before we continue, this hypothesis most likely correlates with the Savannah Hypothesis. This theory states that bipedality was adapted for the convenient use of freeing up their hands. The extra free limbs can be used for tools or for a carrying action. This new perk would overcome the new disadvantage, slow speed. Tool use can be very beneficial in an emergency situation that required moving in quick succession, such as if a predator attacked. To compensate for the slow speed, the early hominin could use its tool to fend itself off. Freed up hands can also lead to multitasking and complex construction like tool building. It also allowed hominins to obtain food and the ability to carry more food in a cradling position. Quadrupedal posture wouldn't be able to hold to a tool or use it as efficiently as a bipedal ape. All of these theories more closely correlate with each other rather than one being entirely correct. The hypotheses more likely go in order. In early hominins, two factors in bipedalism occurs within evolution. The first is partial bipedalism, and the second is full bipedalism. Early hominins were contrary to the latter. The fossil record doesn't support full bipedalism in these early hominins yet. They share the traits of quadrupedal and bipedal aspects. The postural feeding hypothesis came first, evolving partial bipedal early hominins. These hominins lived in the trees and eventually started walking on the ground bipedally. This led to the provisional hypothesis. This hypothesis shows the beginning in relationships and the reduction in male hominin canines. The lack of the evolution of modern bipedalism in this theory 
is fulfilled in the Savannah hypothesis, which can also correlate with the free hands hypothesis. These two theories support the evolution of modern bipedalism in these early hominids. Evolution in early hominids is not an easy process, and we will probably never fully understand how it actually happened. But now you have an idea on what might have happened. Our understandings on this topic can be and hopefully changed for the good with a new discovery on a solid piece of evidence that might tell us what happened. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for spending your time to learn about the origins of our evolution.